the first edition we do it in English. And uh, it's a great pleasure to have Peter Corbett from My Strategy Labs today with us. And we want to thank the U.S. Embassy and Christina for making this possible. So please, big round of applause for our guest today. Thank you. Uh, we had a chance to talk uh, before this uh, conversation here. And um, Startup Grind has been very important for us because we, we've been introducing lo local entrepreneurs, uh, local, let's say, inspirational stories on how how and where maybe Kosovo should should have what what it would be the successful way for these youth that we have. So having an international speaker with international experience is a great pleasure. So welcome to Christina. Welcome, Thank congratulations. Thanks for having me. So. Uh, you've been here for quite some days, right? A okay. couple, couple of days. So yeah. maybe just first impression about Christina. Mm. So this is my second time in the Balkans. Uh, I was in Bosnia and Herzegovina and then Serbia last year. Uh, and I think Christina, th thankfully, has all the great food that I love. Mm -hmm. uh, I found my Borek that I dream about sometimes, and then Chivapi, of course, which is you know my staple right. for for lunch. Um, and then I really I've gotten to hang out at the uh, Christina Hacker space. Right. And you know while I I have a company now, you know, 85 employees that you know over 50 uh, 15 million in revenue. We grew up as little hackers, like right. operating out of like weird little places, and it feels so authentic and real. So it's nice. so exciting for me to go there and do a couple workshops. And so I really got the sense that there's something interesting happening here. Already. Beautiful. So I think you, you, you kind of touched on something that maybe uh, I wanted to start our conversation with. I know you've had some workshops, maybe more, more hands-on about your current experience. Mm -hmm. but. Uh, you mentioned something very interesting that you, you liked and it, it felt like uh, your own beginnings. So I want to start with your, 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 let's say your early childhood. Sure. I think that's important for, for any entrepreneur, yeah. for any successful yeah. entrepreneur. And uh, you were born in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. You were born to you know, a single mother raising three, three kids, kids without, uh, really without a lot of money. I remember she worked at Red Lobster. I don't know if you know what that is, but I, it's I like know, a, I miss the soup. Well, I don't know that it's that great. Um, <laughs> but yeah, she's a waitress, right? right? And so growing up as a kid, if I wanted uh, to buy a video game uh, or candy, I'd ha I had to figure out how to make the money. Um, and so I grew up being a little entrepreneur uh, out of necessity. And it turns out that uh, that was a crucial way to be brought up because eventually, you know, I got laid off and that's how I started this company. Right. So again, out of necessity, um, you know, I had to figure out how to pay rent. And thankfully, I'm way beyond paying rent now, but uh, having that, like, that gritty hustle baked into me from the beginning uh, has been one of the greatest assets that I can imagine. And I have a lot of friends that were born wealthy who had all the advantages, and they're not nearly as successful. Right. But the, in, your, in your early days, you were also programming and yeah. doing games. Yeah, uh, before the, the graphic stuff? user interface to the web, I think it was like 1988 or 89, I got my hands on a computer, I was eight or nine years old, and I was uh, already building little custom scripts to get my modem, my 2800 baud modem, to dial up local BBSs to get access to bulletin boards. And I don't know if what I've just said, some of the younger people in the room are like, what the hell are you saying? Uh, and then others of you are like, yeah, I remember that. Anyone who was on BBSs back in the day? Anyone in this room? No. I'm an old man. I didn't even know that I was an old man. I'm 36. I thought that I might old, still I'm be a little young. You, so. uh, yeah, and then you know, DOS came, and then Windows, which was a big deal. Uh, so from the very early days, I was absolutely obsessed and in love with computers. Um, but thankfully, I also am obsessed and in love with with people. So I'm right. really good with with people. I'm great at selling. I'm great at marketing. All those things. So it's rare to do the like engineering, design, marketing, and business thing all in your brain at the same time. Um, but I'll have to say, I was really concerned while I was growing up that I wasn't great at one thing, because I had all these friends who were like, a great engineer, uh, or a great designer, or a great architect, or what have you, winning these awards. I never won anything, because I was like a seven across the board at things. And I was like, oh, am I just mediocre? Mm -hmm. But it turns out that like, being pretty good at a diverse number of things makes for maybe the possibility to be a really good CEO. If you can see all the pieces of the puzzle, your engineers uh, respect you because you're technical, your designers respect you because you're, uh, you have a good aesthetic, uh, and your strategists respect you because you're you know, a good strategist. So 
that's sort of the so background. Then something happened in your life, right? Uh, in terms of uh, you, you went to a risk school, or I went to a boarding school. But yeah, yeah. I think it was a different, uh, a different, not very well accepted initially, rejected yeah. maybe. But then you, uh, I read that you found a very good way in, in not be becoming, let's say, a conformist and dealing with that yeah. in terms of, 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 of just a, because you had the vision, right? Yeah, you, so you've done your you homework. Have, huh? I've you've done, done your homework. homework. Yeah, I've I've done my homework. <laughs> um, so, you know, I was saying uh, growing up, you know, not coming from privilege. Uh, in, in the United States, we have boarding schools, right? So essentially you leave home uh, and you sleep at the school. And um, I applied to, I think, 12 schools. And I got into, I basically got into all of them, and I, I got into and I went to the best boarding school in, in the United States, which is Phillips Exeter yes. Academy. Yes. And when I got there, it was a culture shock for me, because I was this Italian-American kid uh, with long hair. I still have long hair. It's in the man bun, which is this you know, popular, stylish thing to do. Um, and I showed up, you know, there's all these kids in you know, their blazers and their dress shirts who... You know, their parents have boats and mansions, and I didn't come from that world. And so I wasn't accepted. I had, like, four friends. Like, only four friends. And I was accustomed to being, I was accustomed to being popular. I always have a lot of friends because I can hang out with the geeks, I can hang out with the jocks, I can hang out with the hippies, I can hang out with the stoners, like, Especially all of that. being Italian, I mean, that yeah. helps, you know. It does help. It does. Uh, Same with uh, Albanians. So. And so it was weird to not be cool or not be popular. And I realized that um, in certain situations, you have to decide whether or not you're going to try and swim upstream or you're going to be a chameleon. And is this conforming? Do you have to conform? And I realized that 16 years old, it doesn't matter. Like it, it, if you think you are a certain person, that's gonna change anyway. So I decided that I was just gonna be myself and be the friendly person that I always had been. Uh, and take advantage of that opportunity. It turned out that going to Exeter was probably, A, one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life. I, I grew up getting straight A's, and when I got to Exeter, I was getting straight B's, and I was like the dumb kid. I'd never been the dumb kid. Uh, I think 65, 65 students out of 300 in my class applied early to Harvard and got in. Right? I think half the school went to Ivy League colleges. I didn't. I went to Emory, which is still a good school, top 20 in the U.S., but... Like, I was the slacker, apparently. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's hard. Being surrounded by people that are better than you, smarter than you, um, that really drives me. And so I continue to seek that out. I never want to be the smartest person in the room. That, that makes me sad. If I'm the smartest person in the room, I've got to, I've got to find another room, basically. Unless I'm mentoring or sharing something, right. you know? <laughs> yeah. So I mentioned culture and I mentioned education as probably two key uh, elements as a foundation yeah. for any young entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. And then uh, something that I tell especially this younger crowd here that is uh, seeking to become a future entrepreneurs that, you know, at least how we embrace an uh, entrepreneurial uh, environment. And then you went to work for a TV station, right? Yeah. That didn't turn out very well. No. Was it yeah. a relationship with your girlfriend or the no, or so you know, I or... was uh, I was in business school at Emory, and you know, I had started a couple of businesses when I was there. Nothing major, but you know, a good way to make money, basically. And I fell in love with media, and I wanted to produce content. I wanted to, you know, make a documentary. So I made a documentary, um, and I figured out how to get school credit for that, which was really great. And so I was like, oh, I'll go to New York. I'll be a TV producer. This would be awesome. And I worked for a fashion television production company. So, you know, I shot uh, runway shows, you know, big New York Fashion Week, you know, things like that all over the world. I uh, interviewed, you know, all the famous designers, Dolce & Gabbana, Vera Wang, Michael Kors, Oscar de la Renta, um, you know, and all the famous models, Giselle Bündchen, who said she remembered me, which I don't, I don't know that that was the case. Uh, and even Donald Trump, uh, which was really, that was strange at the time to interview him. Um, and I realized that like this is sexy and exciting, but absolutely not intellectually stimulating at all. Like it was not hard. It was so therefore it was not interesting. And I think most people would be like, "You quit your job as a TV producer in New York City, like shooting fashion shows around the world to do what?" And what I did is I moved to DC because I was dating a girl uh, who had gone to business school with me, and we broke up like immediately as soon as I moved down. 
Right. Which is the sort of typical thing, I guess. As uh -huh. soon as you move somewhere for someone, that happens. Or at least it happened to me. And I stayed in D.C. And D.C. is not the kind of place where you'd expect to find a company like us. Uh, it's right. not known to be the center of innovation and creativity. And it turns out that building the kind of company that I've built there means we stand out like a sore thumb. And that is incredible when you're trying to market the business. Like any little thing that we did, we're on TV for it <laughs> locally. Right. Or the Washington Post is writing about it. And they still do. Yesterday we launched a little AI bot for the Washington Capitals, which is the hockey team in, in uh, DC. And you know, the Washington Post wrote a whole thing about it. And guess what? Building an AI is not a hard thing to do. Right. But it's like, oh my God, like creative, innovative company. <clears throat> I strategy lab builds chatbot for the Wizards. And they're like, or the, uh, the Capitals. It's like, okay, right. who cares? Don't tell them I said that. But like, but really, it's not, not that hard. The, I think it's very important thing what we just kind of uh, went talked about because uh, luck and chance are very important. Yeah, sure. I, I believe they're important yeah. part in your, let's say, this entrepreneurial mm -hmm. path. And uh, for you, you started, uh, you, you left your job, actually you were laid off. I got right? laid off. Yeah. You got laid off from your job in, in Washington. You had three months of funds for existing and then you decided to go on your own. How, how does that happen? A lot of people, you yeah. see, we would have had a bigger audience today. If, if it wasn't for people working. But some of these people are working and they're here. I'm glad they're so, working. So uh, <laughs> the, this, is the, this is the trigger we want to ask. Yeah. When does one make that change? The, well, I was forced to make that decision. I got laid off on a Friday. But you also found another job, right? This is the thing. So um, I was always an entrepreneur. I, you know, whether it was the typical thing as a kid or when I was in college uh, doing certain things. Um, and so I got laid off at the age of 27. And I'd always told myself, you know, no matter what, I have to build my own company one day. And I gave myself a deadline. I said, at the age of 30, no matter what, I'm gonna quit whatever I'm doing. Okay. And I don't care what it is, I'll sell hot dogs. I'll sell hot dogs on a cart on the street as long as I own the hot dog cart, right? So I got laid off when I was 27. And I thought to myself, well, maybe these next three years, like I can just try anything. Like, let me just try anything. I'm not married yet. I don't have a mortgage. I don't have kids. I don't have a dog. I don't have a cat. I don't have anything except for, like, I have to take care of myself. And my cost of living at the time, you know, was about $3,000 a month. Um, and that's what it costs to live in D.C. in just a normal one-bedroom apartment and be able to, you know, buy some beer every once in a while. Uh, so it's, you know, like Christina, if it was like 700 euro a month, right? So I had that equivalent for three months. I was like, okay. I need to figure out how not to starve and die. Because, well, I wouldn't have starved or died. I would have had to move back in with my parents, which is like dying when you're 27 <laughs> and you're single, right? And you don't, want to, you don't want to do that. Very shameful. That was shameful. It's just like, <laughs> God, I don't want to do that. Love my parents, but that would be horrible. So I decided, I, you know, that Friday I got laid off. Um, I got really drunk that night with my friends and woke up the next day, you know, with a headache and uh, realized I didn't want to, I didn't want to wake up on Monday not knowing what to do and I didn't want sort of the story to be, oh, Peter got laid off. I wanted the story to be, oh, he started a company, right? right? So I, I can't help but think in marketing terms and right. sort of PR terms sometimes. I was like, that's a much better story, right? right? So, oh shit, I better like come up with some name let me just make a WordPress site. Let me throw this thing up on the internet and come Monday, I'll just email everybody, which is what I did. Right. And in the first week I had projects. You know, I was uh, built, doing a logo project for $500, uh, which I'm not sure if I got paid for. <laughs> uh, and then like a WordPress site for like $2,500. And that was the beginning of like, can I just make $3,000 a month? And let me see if I can do that. And I did, I was like, okay, I can do this. Can I? can I actually make more than my cost of living? And by the end of that year, um, I think I'd done about almost $400,000 in projects. Uh, I had saved about 400,000, uh, sorry, $40,000 in profit. And I thought, wow, I could just like spend all this money on an employee, let's do that. Uh, so I hired an employee who was actually my brother, who was my first hire, uh, got an office and like it just started to go. I was gonna ask you about your brother as yeah. the first hire because this is typical Albanian, but then oh, yeah. I found out that you're Italian, and I think... It's typical Italian, I think. Right, but Albanian yeah. as well, so. How did, how did that go? That, how did that go? <laughs> uh, 
How is uh, that going? Are you still together? Uh, are you? Well, we're still brothers. <laughs> uh, how did that go? So, Joe was the chief operating officer of the I'm company. sorry, the reason for asking yeah. is because a lot of these people, they were having a small community, this is what they go for. And you oh, know, what, it. is it a yes or a no? I get it. This is, a, this is advice. Um, Joe was the COO of the company for the first four years. And I think he was exactly the person that the company needed at that time. He literally slept on the floor of the office on an air mattress while he built the office around itself. And there are not that many people that would do that. You know, someone you just hire off the street, for example. Uh, and then having someone I could ultimately trust, you know, very early on was crucial. Uh, we got into a situation where we no longer wanted to work with each other. Um, and so we decided to part ways and it didn't, we didn't part ways on the most amicable terms. And so for several years after that, we didn't speak very much. We didn't have much of a relationship. Uh, and that's changing for the better now, right. thankfully, which is great, but it's taken years, right. years to heal that. And so my best advice for people who are considering working with their family members is to take it very seriously. Don't make a very light decision and just say, oh yeah, of course, I'm gonna hire my brother, or I'm gonna work with my sister, or work for my dad or my mom. Or this is very serious, and your family relationship is much more important than the business. And right. so the fundamental issue was that in the moment when we were sort of separating, uh, I acted more like a CEO than I did like a brother. And it's really hard when you're in the trenches fighting to build a company and every day feels like you're either gonna die or you're gonna like thrive and go to the moon to get out of the mindset of CEO and get into the mindset of brother. Doing that emotional brother thing feels, it feels weak, I'll be honest, it feels weak in that moment and it feels like I don't wanna make very important financial decisions for the business based on emotion. Mm -hmm. I never wanna make financial decisions based on emotion. And it's just so hard to separate those things. Right. So that would be my, you know, the learning of you know working with my brother is for anybody out there like right. really think about it. Right. And if you don't have to do it, I would say don't do it. Right. No, I think it's important. But at the same time, I have a number of friends who have worked with their brothers and their sisters and their family members for so long, right. and they've done so well. And I just wondered, like, am I just not as good at that as them, or like what what yeah. is that? So, so it just needs some deeper thought. Consideration. consideration. Some very real consideration. Then your company starts growing. Yeah. And uh, I think growth brings new challenges. Sure. Managing growth is not easy. Sure. And uh, some decisions that you have to make, probably more strategic, mm -hmm. uh, are important. Mm -hmm. Deciding to stay in DC mm -hmm. was probably one of those tough decisions. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, 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 I read you saying something very important. Uh, that being in DC gives you exactly as you mentioned the popularity sure. that you would not get maybe in some other places. Sure. So, and you said the people that go chasing money, you know, maybe you should go and do that, but you would not be one of them. Mm -hmm. right? So, yeah. how how does that look? All right, what do I think about that? Um, so the first thing is that I I thankfully grew up as you know like a chess player and a strategic thinker. And so I viewed the landscape of DC as this like blank canvas that I felt that I could paint on and that it was one of the blankest canvases of any major American city or any global city in the world, frankly. And so as an entrepreneur, I think you wanna find those blank canvases. And so I could have moved back to New York and if I moved back to New York, what is that? Like I'm trying to splash some paint on a Jackson Pollock. Like no one is gonna see that and it's gonna be so hard for me to, to bootstrap this thing for nothing. So I saw DC as a blank canvas, and then I realized that if I actually succeeded in building an interesting company, um, we'd probably be the place that the most talented engineers and designers would seek out, uh, because they're frankly you know, bored and underutilized working for the Department of Defense or some you know, government agency or some nonprofit. Not to say that nonprofits don't do great work, um, and that turned out to be the case. And then it also turned out to be the case, and I, and I knew this, that Google and Facebook uh, and any given like hot Silicon Valley funded startup wasn't gonna open an engineering office in DC. Right. Why? You know, they're gonna do it in the Valley and then the next stop in the US is probably either Austin or New York and then abroad. 
right? So I don't have to compete for talent with like the artificially stimulated, massively VC-backed startup ecosystem. Right. Um, my talent will come and stay, and that has been the case. So building a company where people love to be there, have really interesting projects to work on, and tend to not leave right away has been crucial. So people always said, oh, Peter, but you, you seem like you sh your company should be in Silicon Valley. I'm like, I would never in a million years ever want to be in Silicon Valley. That is basically the worst idea for my company possible. I, I try to avoid that like the plague. Uh, and so I think that strategy has worked out. The last strategy was if we build a very serious uh, foundation of a business in DC, uh, we can always attack other markets. So I viewed it as like, build a castle, make the moat, have a drawbridge, and then like shoot arrows that are flaming fireballs in other places. And that's New York for us now, where I'm based, um, and where the company that acquired ours is based. So yeah, that was, that so was the approach. How, who, who are your clients today? What, what, do, what does your company do now? Mm -hmm. We talked a little bit of how, but maybe just uh, yeah. uh, and where it is right now, and maybe where it's going. Where it's going. Uh, so our clients are typically Fortune 500s, right? So the big companies. Um, we're the social agency of record for Volkswagen. Uh, we manage all their social presences. We create all the content. We optimize all the content. Back with paid media. Uh, do really fun campaigns for them. Um, we do work with NBC Universal. Mm -hmm. um, have some of you seen the Mr. Robot TV show? So we some did all the marketing work for Mr. Robot season one and season two launch, which is really an awesome. Mm -hmm awesome project and show, show to work on. Work with people like Viacom, I like Nickelodeon. Mm -hmm. uh, Facebook. Facebook is a client of ours. We do data visualization, mm -hmm. user interface design for Facebook, and we build internet connected devices for them as well. So it's kind of, it's cool to have a company like Facebook who's incredible at engineering and design say, Peter, we need your incredible engineers and designers to make stuff for us. Right. Not, not too shabby. Um, and so we do a lot of social, we do a lot of content, and we build web and mobile applications and internet connected devices. Some of those devices, as I said, made for Facebook, also for Nickelodeon, uh, Anheuser-Busch, General Electric, uh, and a few others. Right. Yeah, and so where's it going? Where's it um, going? God, globally, very fast actually. Um, we were acquired August 1st of this year, so that's like 10 weeks ago, uh, by the world's largest publicly traded holding company uh, for advertising agencies, which is WPP. Mm -hmm. um, and we very quickly, I think, might end up having an office in Singapore, Hong Kong, and maybe London. So I'm dealing with now possibly doubling the company again in the next you know, 18 months to two years. Mm -hmm. uh, and the company, you know, we doubled revenue last year in our eighth year. And so, yeah, the sort of hockey stick thing is is real even in the service business context and i'll just say one thing about hockey sticks because you know a lot of people say oh we want to see like a revenue hockey stick before we invest in you uh as soon as i had that people said I'm really worried about that is that sustainable I was like, are you can someone shoot me now like really like i've done my job i've done the thing that everyone wants and now you're telling me that maybe that's concerning right crazy so yeah. a big global uh, expansion, right? So yeah, it's going to take time, but it might happen much faster. Bit, or? Yeah, I'm the CEO still. Um, you know, I have a boss now, which is yeah. so take interesting. Take some employees from Kosovo. <laughs> What's that? Take some employees. Take some, em take some employees. We're opening an office here, right? right. Um, it's interesting. I am, I am the CEO of iStrategy Labs, but I have a CEO that I report to who has a CEO that they report to. Who knew how many layers of CEOs there could be? Uh, but when there's 190,000 employees of this company, and then the network that we're in has, uh, I think, 12,000, there's going to be some levels and layers. But I will say uh, it's super exciting to have peers to learn from. I don't claim to know everything about this right. business or any given business. So now I've got a peer group of people that, you know, they have a thousand employees that report to them. I have you 85. afraid this will affect your creativity? Maybe it will slow down mm. some of the, this big... Well, I'll say if creativity is sort of like a river. Like, it's not going to stop flowing. It's just like, does it hit a dam and slow break it? Uh, so, no, I'm not worried that my own creativity or the company's creativity will be impacted. It's a question of whether or not it will still be able to flow quickly to the ocean. Right. That's you know, and if, if it gets dammed up, yeah, either it, it pulls up in a lake and it's got to find its release somehow, and so we'll find our release in our own internal projects right. or otherwise, 
or breaks the dam. I'm totally willing to break the dam, meaning right. like break the bureaucracy that may now be a thing that we have to deal with. And I'm, I'm not necessarily saying, well, sure, there's bureaucracy in the context we're in, but um, I still get to run the company as essentially an independent unit. So I, I haven't seen that yet. Yeah, of course. Two years in, you know, if it's just bureaucracy all day, I mean, I'm going to want to shoot myself. I don't know that I can deal right. with that. Right. Uh, another important part of your engagement, I would say, it's, it's really working a lot with the Washington mm -hmm. uh, ecosystem, mm -hmm. DC's ecosystem. Yeah. Um, I think that's very important, something mm -hmm. we also try to do here in mm -hmm. Kosovo, and I think you've been from the early start helping out, having some great ideas, sure. helping people, connecting people. I think that has also helped you at the same time. Sure. So, uh, how easy or how difficult was it to, to get the community together and have a vibrant community in a place which is yeah. seen as a very bureaucratic... Yeah, I don't know that like easy or difficult is the right yeah, sort of spectrum. spectrum. Um, you know, I, when I came to DC, it was 2005, mm -hmm. and so I should give the context economically of right. where DC was and, and the country was. So uh, you had the bust in 2000 or, or 2001 in the stock market, and then you had 9-11, and then the US goes into a recession, uh, starts to come out of the recession in like late 2003, early 2004, and the startup ecosystem in DC had not picked its head back up. So it had AOL and it had these, these MCIs and, and UUNets and all these sort of first generation tech companies, but it, it didn't pop back up yet. And so when I showed up, I was just like, where, where are all the like, you know, technologists and the entrepreneurs, like where is everybody? And it, they weren't really connecting. And because I love people and I love convening people, um, I just started bringing people together. The first thing I did was this thing called Twin Tech, which was about bringing the young crew together with the veterans of the technology community, and 800 people showed up. And they showed up because I, I promoted it as having free beer. And it turns out that free beer is the most powerful marketing phrase on the planet. Uh, I haven't found anything that works better. Uh, and then the second one, uh, I think like 1,500 people came. And then the third one, 2,200 people came. And that's when the Washington Post did a like, business section cover story on me and this ecosystem saying like, oh my God, there's something here. There's actually 2,000 people in Washington DC that might actually care about technology, might actually care about startups. And so for the next 10 years basically, brick by brick, uh, myself and a number of other community leaders, we just kept convening people and s smashing them together uh, so that, like, with that smashing, mashing up, you get friction, and friction is a spark, and that's an idea, and that's a company, and that's a deal, and that's an investment. And so we then created a, a festival called DC Week, which I think probably played the most important role in catalyzing the sort of creative technology community in the DC region than anything else that had been done. Um, and what we did was, we said, okay, for this week, um, we're going to host hundreds of events. Here's the calendar. Put your event on the calendar. Uh, we're going to throw a big opening party and a big closing party, and let's see what happens. Uh, 6,000 people showed up. Next year, 10,000 people showed up. Third year, 12,000 people showed up. Right? So by getting all of those people together and meeting each other and then hosting like a 3,000-person keynote event so you can put like all this energy in one room, Right, and to see keynotes by you know uh, Travis from Uber at the time, who I think Uber was like a year old, right, right? like talking about his vision for what this thing was going to be, um, was crucial. And then the last thing was um, starting to get myself out of the way. And so that's something that I think sometimes community leaders uh, or leaders in general uh, don't realize. Like if the whole thing is predicated on your efforts, it's not going to be sustainable. So I started moving out of the way, putting people in place that could be leaders in specific areas. I had started DC Tech Meetup that has 22,000 members now. About 1,000 people come every month to see demos by early stage startups. And I think some people thought, oh, Peter wants to like be the king. He's like creating a, a throne to sit on. And I was like, no, I'm not going to be there on that throne. Uh, I want other people to have the ability to lead and, and have the spotlight. So that was key 
that I didn't try to own the ecosystem, that I actually got out of the way of leadership uh, as soon as it was really rolling. That's very important. Which happened to be at the same time when my company started taking off, so yeah. I couldn't really spend as much time doing the community work that I was doing. When but the you're still was very over. active, you visit a lot of countries, I think you've been yeah, in many all countries. and 70 something countries. Uh, this is probably, I don't even know, 30, 30 something uh, inc uh, incubators or accelerators of some form that I've visited and uh, done workshops in and just sat down and had coffee and mentored people. Uh, entrepreneurs are, that's my tribe. You guys are my, my people. I don't want to hang out with anyone else uh, more. Uh, certainly not a room full of lawyers. I'm sorry if there's any lawyers in the room uh, or accountants, and I'm also sorry if there are any accountants in the room. We need you guys, but uh, yeah, I want to hang out with entrepreneurs all day and help them uh, with the issues they face because I've been there and I'm still there. Still yeah, doing. It helps you also. It gets you inspired. Gets meeting new people, different cultures. It helps you as a person and your hundred percent, right? For sure. Um, God, I learn. Uh, every single day, the day I stop learning, uh, I probably should just die. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I learn the most from people that are trying to do something different. Also something that I noticed about your team is very diverse. Yeah. In terms of yeah. ethnic, cultural, mm -hmm. gender, mm -hmm. probably different mm -hmm. uh, social and demographics, norms. So how important is that to create a, a good community crucial. In, in choosing your team? Yeah, I think it's crucial. And especially in a, you know, sort of the technology industry, everyone's probably very well aware that there's a lot of gender and, and uh, diversity issues. I, about four years ago, I realized that if I'm not like, conscious of building a diverse and inclusive company, I fall into the trap of just having like a bro programmer culture, and I just find that to be disgusting. So I literally tell my executive team uh, they have to bring a diverse pool of candidates to the table for every hire. Mm -hmm. And early on, it wasn't that way. I, you're moving so fast, and you're just hiring the people that you know, and it turns out you hire, you know people that are like you, so that means like a lot of white guys, maybe. Mm -hmm. And so I said to my executive team, uh, bring me X number of diverse candidates. Let's base our hires on merit which is what you have to do and you should do. Uh, but if you bring me three white guys for a job, I'm gonna ask you for three non-white guys before we make a decision. Mm -hmm. And that's a simple thing to ask your team to do. And mind you, I won't say whom, but like I got pushback. They're like, oh no, but like I don't know if we can do that. And I'm like, well, okay, then you're not gonna hire anyone. I'm like, oh, I guess we can do that, mm -hmm. right? So it takes, I think, leadership at the top to do that. And the reason why it's important, uh, not only because I think like culturally, it, you could build a crappy company if it's not diverse. Um, the kind of work that we do has to be sort of, it has to resonate with a, a massive population of people. The campaigns mm -hmm. we do reach millions and millions of people. And if we didn't understand that diverse audience base, our campaigns wouldn't work. Right. So, you know, the fact that half the company is female and 30% of it comes from a you know, minority background is a real asset. Right. So any suggestion on how teams from countries that don't have the luxury of choosing teams could help solve this problem? Well, I'd start with gender diversity. Um, you know, the women were the original like super programmers. I don't know if most people understand that. Like guys didn't do the programming in the beginning and somehow, you know, they uh, elbowed the ladies out of the room. And now I think, and I know you guys are doing great work in this respect, is really making sure that we support programs to get women encouraged uh, to become engineers. And so we found some really, really talented female engineers in DC. Uh, and we also, on a monthly basis, I think we host uh, women who code and then black girls who code. Um, and then a number of other, I think Pi Girls, Rails Girl, like we host all of the, the female engineering programs because we have a really big, beautiful uh, office space and we can host like 300 person events and things like that. Um, so I would encourage you to think about gender diversity first. Uh, you might not have like a, a huge population, you know, of Hispanics or African Americans or, you know, otherwise. So that's going to be really hard from an ethnic background point of view to be diverse in, in Kosovo. But from a gender point of view, you can be. Right. Uh, maybe I would like to give also an audience some, some time for questions. But uh, maybe uh, my maybe a last comment about uh, any tips, any suggestion of what these young entrepreneurs uh, should be looking for 
and what what the future should hold for them. Right? Yeah, um, you know, as, as much as I love like the real world and meeting people, I do think it's important to spend a tremendous amount of time on the internet. Mm -hmm. I, love, I love the internet. Uh, if you're not spending a huge amount of time on the internet, going through programming tutorials or teaching your things about all things social media marketing or even just like teaching yourself how to be a designer or a 3D uh, modeler, like stop sleeping is basically what I'm saying. Like stop sleep, if you, actually if you're watching TV, if you're watching too much soccer or football or whatever you call it, yeah. either way you call it, it's a waste of your time. You only have a certain amount of time in the universe and you're either gonna sit there watching other people perform watching other people perform in a sport, or watching other people perform in business or whatever, or you're gonna be the performer, okay? So cut the TV cord, uh, get on the web, learn the things you know you need to learn, and then apply that to building a business. Uh, or building a nonprofit, uh, something that's actually gonna produce some good in the world. Uh, I, I'm just amazed that uh, people spend so much of their time doing things that are not productive. Right. And I think today it's, uh, the information is more open than ever, even for Kosovo, which uh, remains at large the most isolated country in Europe. And uh, I think that's a great advice. And uh, with that, I want to conclude this first part, unless I fail to mention, but I'm sure the audience, I want to give, uh, I really uh, want to give the audience a chance to maybe ask some more questions. So I want to thank you for this thank very you. first part. Yeah, we have a mic, so maybe some questions for the audience, uh, specific, general, uh, yeah. So you don't watch football? No, no, at all. And I, and I love Juventus, I love Italian teams. Hi, my name is, Bas my name is Baskin. I wonder that uh, you mentioned before that uh, it will be very mistake if you will move uh, your company in the Silicon Valley. Mm. I'm very curious to know which is the reason. Is uh, uh, yeah. because of challenge or something? No, imagine, uh, imagine the company is a nice juicy steak, right? Like a filet mignon, and that is a talented group of people. Silicon Valley is like throwing that into a lion's cage, and everyone comes and rips it apart because your talent is going to go everywhere. So, I'd prefer to be in a place where we're nice and safe and uh, can recruit people that are gonna love this company and stick with the company and not just job hop every time a new startup raises a bunch of money and offers them a huge new salary with a bunch of equity. So, yeah, I'd rather leave my stake out of the lion's cage. Poking is a big problem in Kosovo right now as well yeah. because the number of talented people is very scarce and the demand is growing for sure. different service. So we, we, we have that similarity, at least the Silicon Valley now. Talent is always going to be an issue, and that's yeah. why you have to build a, a great company, one that has a great culture, one that right. pays uh, very well, uh, and that you minimize the bullshit. And part of minimizing the bullshit is not being an egomaniac, too, as the CEO and the founder. This company is not the Peter show. It never has been, and I never wanted it to be. Um, I, I go to my headquarters two or three days a month. If this whole thing relied on me being around and being, you know, that the guy, it doesn't work, right? So it has to be about them. It has to be, I guess, just to say about us. Yeah. Maybe you should also just do a small introduction. I know some of you met Peter, but just yeah. to kind of give him the background if you're an entrepreneur or you're a freelancer yeah. or something. Yeah. Peter, during your presentation, you mentioned about the VC funding uh, a lot of startups. Uh, it, it, back there, is there becoming a bubble of this thing, like startups investing a lot of crazy ideas, like nonsense ideas? Like we have Meerkat, like it started like a boom and then just died, like nobody is yeah. even mentioning that anymore. Um, you know, I think that as soon as you use the word bubble, like it just conjures way too many th things. It's too, it's too loaded of a term. Um, so I don't see it that way. Uh, I see there being a a massive bloom of a diverse number of, of companies, whether they're mobile applications like Meerkat or web applications or otherwise. And when you have a massive bloom, there's gonna be a massive die off and that always happens and that's fine. It's, it's like a, you know, you hear this analogy, um, like a field of sunflowers and you just wanna see which are the tall ones. So that's cool, that's fine. Um, I don't think that's a problem at all. Actually, I think it's, 
I think it's a great thing. Like, what's the problem with there being, well, I'll say there is one problem. When there is too much of a bloom, then the talent is too di right. di disperse, and then you can't have a critical mass. But if there's enough of a die off, then that, that soil gets fertile, and then you get taller flowers. I mean, it's a pretty good analogy, or it's a pretty bad one. I don't, you tell me. Um, so I don't worry about a bubble. When people usually say the word bubble, they're talking about valuations. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, that's a rich person's problem. Like that's a yeah. VC problem. And I, I'm not in the business of trying to solve rich guys' problems, rich gals' problems. It's not of interest to me. Uh, I have another one, so. Yeah. Uh, you said that you made the hockey stick. Uh, do you think that you will, uh, in the near future, start to do another hockey stick? Yeah. Or you yeah. will just retire and enjoy the... Oh, a new company? Yeah. Um, not anytime soon. I mean, the nature of this business is that I love it. I created it. Um, I created it with some really great people that are in the company. I want to still work with them. And so, and I'm still young. I mean, I know that I, maybe I'm one of the older people in the room, but, you know, being 36 and having built a company and sold a company by that age for, you know, a significant amount of money makes me not worried about going on to the next thing. Um, I'm going to stick with something that is really working. And if it stops working, I got to figure out why. Did I screw it up? And if I screwed it up, maybe someone else should fix it or should I fix it? So I, it's just not something I'm concerned about right now. I'm going to remain very focused. And I think that um, I, I'm grateful that over time I, I had to be focused. And I have friends who are like, oh, I've got three businesses. And I was like, really? Are, are, are they amazing? And they're like, no, they're not really working out. I'm like, why don't you try one thing that like actually works? So I just stayed very focused and tried not to do some other new business like, Oh, the, the creative agency, digital agency thing is really working. Maybe I should start like a bakery. <laughs> what? No, like stay focused on the thing. And if it's not working, like give yourself a deadline. If you're trying to hustle against something and like three years in, it's, you know, you're borrowing money from your friends and you're not sleeping well, like you got to try to figure out when do you give this thing up? Uh, thankfully, I didn't have to do that. So I'm going to stay, I'm going to stay focused. All right, good. It's also a personal thing, you know. Sometimes you feel completed, you want to get started in your Sure. Team. So well, you know, you... if, let, let's put it this way if I am no longer the CEO of iStrategy Labs one day, which I have to imagine at some point that will happen, um, what would be really interesting would be to do something where I didn't make money. Right. Like, that sounds weird, right? But, like, I've only done that because I had to. So, I don't know what it's like to wake up in the morning and not have to be focused on revenue right. or profit or the cost of things. So what is that like? I don't know. Like, could I just go surfing for years? Maybe, but I think I'd be dramatically bored. Right. I mean, surfing's cool, but uh, I can do it for a month or two. So we have a question. Yeah. From Hi, Peter. I introduced yeah, myself yeah. earlier. Uh, besides the diversity you look for in the company, what are the main characteristics uh, personality characteristics you look in employees. Yeah. Like uh, we can see you're a very down to earth guy. You, yeah. You do a lot of with people. So yeah. what are the main yeah. things? Um, a number of things. I think the first 20 hires I hired personally. Uh, and then I, I don't think I've hired anyone directly since then because my team is well equipped to be able to do that now. Um, I think the first thing was like, I just need talented people. Like at the earliest stages, you need people that can do things and do things well. Uh, it doesn't mean that they need experience, right? So most of the people I hired in the early stage were, you know, really young because that's all I could afford. I couldn't afford, you know, a senior electrical engineer for a six-figure salary. Um, so I look for talented people, but co combine talent with potential. So I'm very fortunate for having, I guess you call it like an instinct for potential. I can meet someone and in the first few minutes, I'm like, huge amount of potential, they're gonna kill it no matter what they do, I hope they kill it with us. And I'll tell you, the first, I think it's probably the first 10 or 15 hires, uh, they had about a half hour interview with me and then they had a job offer in their hands before they got home. I was like, great, oh, great to meet you, yep, solid, good, okay, I'd love you to come on board, okay, bye. And I think there's like, most of those people are actually still with the company. Some of the earliest employees have been there seven, six, seven, five, six, seven years. Um, so talent plus potential. Um, the next thing is there are, I think there are two kinds of people in the world. 
um, one kind of person like absolutely must self-actualize all the time or they're unhappy. And the other half, they don't care. You know, they could watch football all day, it's fine. So that side of the house that wants to self-actualize, they just want to get better. They want to get better at design, engineering, strategy, animation, whatever it is. They are happy when they are upping the bar every single day. And there are people, and so the whole company actually is oriented around helping people self-actualize. There's probably not a single person that's ever joined iStrategy Labs that would say, I'm not better for having done so. I got better. I, uh, I've heard engineers, uh, especially ones that were first jobs out of school, uh, they said like, I became three and four and five times better at what I do in like a year or two, which is an insane thing. Now think about like the value that's being generated when you're investing in human capital that appreciates that fast. How do you think the company has grown as fast as it has? Uh, and then those salaries grow fast. The challenge becomes like, can you increase their compensation along with the value that they are sort of becoming? Uh, and if you can't, you've got a real problem because they're gonna go somewhere else. Um, so yeah, talent, uh, potential, focus on self-actualization. And the last thing, you guys have heard this before, but no, no brilliant jerks, right? So our, I won't say who, okay, never mind. Uh, so we, we had hired, uh, I think only one brilliant jerk, and it was so hard for me to fire that person. And I did, I failed. I did not fire them because they were such a good engineer, really insane, and uh, thankfully they left on their own to join uh, a really, really big tech company, and I was like, oh, thank God. Most people would have been like, oh my God, one of our incredible engineers left, like that really sucks, and I was like, no, thank you. So after that, I, I really focused on making sure we were not hiring brilliant jerks. So we don't hire any. My best advice. Yeah, yeah. Hi, I'm Arendt Fazlio, co-founder of Kutia, local web agency. Uh, currently, we have more than 80% of our clients based on your market, uh, and we are trying to grow on your market, not yeah. locally. Uh, so my question is, uh, did you consider ever to uh, work with outsourcing uh, companies or did you uh, work on the past uh, with outsourcing company in yeah. Balkans or somewhere in uh, yeah. Europe or? Yeah, um, I've, had, I've had some very passionate positions on this over time and at other times, not as passionate. Um, so I felt very passionately that the best work is done sort of side by side, right? Shoulder to shoulder, in the trenches. Uh, I've always wanted my designers to be sitting next to our developers and like iteratively building great stuff. And so the entire company, frankly, besides myself, is all in Washington, DC, all shoulder to shoulder. Uh, and so I was anti-distributed company, anti-virtual company, and you know, 37 Signals or whoever wants to write books about you know, doing it differently. Uh, frankly, I think it's just a personal choice. And I know 37 Signals, the inventors of Basecamp, as you might be aware, uh, then they were distributed and then they co-located. Like actually, like maybe we should have an office in Chicago where people can see each other. Um, so that was like my passionate take over time, which was like best work is done side by side. Then over time, our engineering capability got really sophisticated. And I think that our engineering approach is probably, you know, it's, it's best of breed. Um, you know, doing our, you know, our agile sprint based approach to the world with, you know, continuous deployment um, and using GitHub for our repo and all the things that enable you to actually work with anyone anywhere rather than just like code is on your machine. Like that's a weird thing. Uh, let's not have it be there. So once we got to the point of being really sophisticated, um, I think we felt that it was possible to have collaborators in other places that could work on discrete things with us. And so over time, there's probably been two or three dev shops, very small ones, like five and 10 person shops um, that we knew the founders personally and had met. Um, and I think two of them originally had been based in Washington, DC. Uh, one was German uh, and the other was Russian. And then they just had really good connections back home. Um, and so we would say, listen, uh, Vlad was one and um, Anton was the other. 
So listen, like we trust you implicitly, you personally. Don't know who your team is out there and we don't care as long as they're gonna to adhere to our best practices of engineering. So we're gonna trust you with this scope of work. Uh, here's five grand for this little thing, or here's 10 or 20 or whatever the number is. Uh, and as long as they delivered quality work, we kept hiring them. So we've hired a few shops that way, um, but we don't, I wouldn't say we outsource work, it's more like we insource some of their help because if we're working on something, there's probably five I strategy labs engineers and then like one or two other people working on Android or like we need a little Node.js like help because we've got our Node people are too busy uh, or a little bit of extra Python heavy lifting. Um, and so I think that, you know, that works. Um, I never tried to outsource to make money, which is usually why people do it. They're like, oh, like, I can just hire this for like 30 euro an hour or 20 and like I can charge my client in the US 150 or whatever that number is. And in my world, that gap, that most people would see as margin, right? They're like, oh, it's like profit margin. I was like, no, that's risk margin, right? So I would rather like hire a full-time employee in Washington, D.C. and the average engineering salary is probably $80,000 a year. Uh, in DC for a for mid-level engineer, not a senior engineer. Senior is like 130, something like that, 130K. Um, I said I'd rather hire them and bring that risk down to almost nothing because I have to deliver for the biggest companies in the world and I've only got one reputation and I've only got one shot at like developing that reputation and if I screw them on a seven-figure, like a multi-million dollar project, I'm toast. So, that's been the approach, and I think it's been it's been working. Yeah. Hi, I'm Agon, and I uh, would like to thank you for sharing this valuable information today. Yeah. Uh, my question is maybe a bit long, but I'll cut it. Try to cut it short. Um, considering that in the early stages of your business, uh, you had maybe limited capital. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to know what were your priority investment ideas and what is your biggest and proudest uh, investment that you've ever, you, you consider you ever made. Yeah. Thank you. Um, my priority was revenue, right? Uh, oh, surely. Which I know is like, it's so funny. I have so many friends that are, you know, startup founders and, um, you know, venture backed and they're like, Peter, you make money? I was like, yeah. Yeah, that's what businesses do. And they're like, wow, like, how do you make money? That's crazy. It's like, yeah, it starts with revenue. And then like the costs are lower than the revenue. And they're like, oh, okay. Okay. So yes, revenue was always the priority. It was priority from day one. It's still the priority today. I know that that's not like sexy or innovative. Um, but I think that it's, the, it's been the right model for me. Um, from a like internal investment point of view, we've spent a lot of money, actual hard money, on product development internally. And we've built three key products over time. Um, I think that two of them are you know, middling successes and one of them was a total failure. So I'll just share a little bit about those. Um, the first one is called Grandstand and it's a data visualization platform uh, built on Node.js that enables us to take um, real-time social data from any social API and turn it into an interactive display that's animated and beautiful. And we, act, we made it accidentally, uh, and then we ended up licensing it to th probably 30 customers and did over a million dollars in revenue, um, which, which was profitable for us to do. And I, it, it's a mild success, like barely a success. And I know that might sound crazy, like, oh, a million dollars in the product you just like came up with, isn't that great? Um, but in the context of like technology products in the US, like no one, no one wants a million dollar revenue generating product. Like that's not an interesting thing. But equivalent here would be like $10 million revenue generating product or six or seven. That's okay, fine, maybe that's, maybe that's cool. Um, More like 100K. 100K? Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I went the other. I went the wrong way. Um, so yeah, who wants 100? Does anyone want a 100K technology product here? Not really. If that's all it's going to do. Um, but what was so good about it? Maybe we made we made a little bit of money uh, building that product. Um, 
it changed the way that we did engineering. So the fact that we're dealing with massive volumes of real-time data forced us, first of all, forced us off of PHP, which was the original like, language that we did most of our work in, uh, which is a piece of shit. Uh, sorry for any of the PHP developers in the room. Uh, got us to be much more focused on JavaScript and specifically Node.js. And originally it was like Node.js and Angular. Um, and now we've gone even farther down the path and we just feel like Python in general is like the best language to work in and then Django is the best framework for us to build applications in. And you're yeah, fine, Python versus Rails like doesn't matter frankly. Dot net, I'm like, we can leave that over there. Um, the second product was something called Back Channel, which frankly we had no business even building. It was a, a tool for companies to understand in real time the sentiment of their employees, like the morale, what's the morale look like, and it created a, it was called Back Channel, so it created an anonymous chat system for employees to talk about the company. Um, and so we launched it internally and it was really interesting. And I'm a very transparent leader and to see the stuff being said, I was like, I'm basically the only CEO that's gonna ever deploy this product. Like, there's no way most people are gonna let their employees chat anonymously and like rank their executives in real time. Like, that's fucked up. Like, it's not gonna work. They're not gonna have customers, so we killed it. Uh, and then the third one is a internet connected device called the selfie mirror. So it's a physical device. It's a mirror that when you smile, it takes a picture and posts it to your social media accounts. Uh, it's not meant for consumers. We've sold uh, dozens of them to uh, people like Marriott Hotels and Bud Light, the beer, uh, Today Show, and, and the NFL, and a few others. So uh, that's a discrete physical product that, um, God, I think we sell those for like fifty to $75,000 each, and the hardware components are like $3,000, and it takes us two days to build them. So it's a pretty good product. Um, anyhow, so that's just, we're still doing that. We're still iterating on it. We're on like version number six, uh, refining it. I don't think there's a huge market for it, but the margins are insane. So if we only sell, you know, half a million or a million dollars of them a year, great. I'll, I'll be happy to have that revenue and right. profit. Uh, I don't know if you can smell, but there's some Italian pizza. Oh yeah? Yeah. Okay. We usually have some time also for networking Great. and for pizza. So I would like to thank you one more time for your time. And um, I'm sure I invite all of you to, to, to go upstairs and kind of network and chat. Very good. So great pleasure to have you. Thank My you pleasure. one more time. Thank you. Thank you.